Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University. In this video, we're going to talk about Darknet and YOLO. I don't mean Darknet like the internet, I mean Darknet like multiple object detection. You probably see all these boxes around me as the system is able to detect various things. We will see how we can make use of this technology in Python using TensorFlow. For the latest on my AI course and projects, click subscribe and the bell next to it to be notified of every new video. All right, you'll notice I am in Google Colab for this one. We're going to be making use of the GPU. So let's go ahead and make sure you have class six of mine open in Google Collaboratory. It's on GitHub. I have a link to the GitHub repository at the bottom of this video in the description. And we're going to Go to runtime, change runtime type, and I already have it in there, but make sure that you have the GPU. Don't worry about this Python 3.6 YOLO. That was from my local environment. Google does not have that, so you'll want Python 3. And we'll save that. So let's scroll down to part five of this because this is what we're talking about. We're going to look at how I was able to shoot that video that you saw leading up to this that has all the squares around it, that. But we're going to start and we're going to look at how we can now recognize multiple images with a convolution neural network. A single convolution neural network, like we looked at a few parts ago, can recognize multiple images if it's big enough. It's able to look at an image and mark these. So you'll see microwave, person, hey, I'm a person, and several bottles sitting on my window. That is true. This is, this is my kitchen, actually. Sink, starting to make dinner. For, for me, not the dog, but he's there wanting to uh, see what I'm see what I'm doing. He's always right around whenever we're cooking something. But this image is trained using exactly the same technology that we saw with the convolution neural networks. This is something called YOLO, and I give you a link to the paper. YOLO stands for you only look once. And what's so cool about this technology is it is using a single convolution neural network that has a fairly complex output layer. So it's not a simple classification, it's also regression. And it literally sends out to you all of these images that it found. So that's what's really, really cool about this, about convolution neural networks. You can make those output layers send out just about anything that you want, really. You can have it send out, in this case, multiple bounding rectangles and what it thinks is in each of those. In the next module, we'll look at GANs and we'll see that it can even output an image. The input to a GAN won't be an image. It will actually be a number, like a seed, and the output will be an image. So a convolution neural network, the input can be images, the output can be images, both the input and the output can be images or one or the other. So we're gonna look at convolution neural networks in quite a few of the modules of this class because they're very multifaceted. You can use them for natural language processing, images. Now you can also run this on a live stream. So this was just a picture that my wife took on, on her cell phone. This is, well, this is also from a cell phone. This was not using the normal camera that I record this class from. So when I was on that video talking about this, I wasn't able to speak to some of the things that it was classifying or misclassifying correctly because it was being recorded to a video. I don't have a strong enough GPU hooked up on one of my local computers here. I normally do GPU in the cloud to actually live stream this sort of a video. If you want to live stream this sort of a video, the GPU, a Titan V would be great. About three thousand bucks for one of those. So I presently do not do not own one of those. I've thought of it, but just have not. Most of the stuff that I do is not live streaming video. So I just I just do this in the cloud and I use V100s, which are similar to those, but it's four bucks an hour rather than many thousands of dollars for a one-time investment. Just depends on what you're gonna do. If I was using that thing hours and hours a day, it would it would make sense to do the 3K. If you look at this, this does show some of the limitations. Notice it's gone berserk on my bookshelf. It is classifying every single one of those books. What is fascinating about this? Up here in the image of my kitchen, it's not class, it's classifying just a handful of things. Here it's classifying hundreds. The processing time is consistent. You only look once. It's not looking at each of those books. We'll see how that works in a moment. But you can see it's classifying the TV monitor and other things. This yellow thing here is actually a toolbox, but it keeps thinking it's a remote control or, or other things. It is correctly classifying my laptop. In the video, it's not always classifying it correctly. It is classifying me as two people. My head is one person, the rest of me is another person. I also stood for this. 
stood up because normally if you've watched a lot of my videos and hopefully have go ahead and subscribe so that you you, you can when i'm sitting down with the usual pose that i use when i introduce and conclude a video it wasn't recognizing me it was just recognizing all my books and who cares that's boring I wanted to recognize me, not that I felt chided or anything by that. It's also recognizing my chair, which is good. That's that's really just one chair. So let's talk about how YOLO works. Because right now, this is just about state-of-the-art for multi-image detection. I mean, you can do some really, really cool things with this. I mean, say I wanted to put a dog door on the back of my house, and I only wanted the dog to go through. I could just write a very simple program to stream it, and so long as I saw a dog somewhere, it would open the door. Hopefully, it would not misclassify a raccoon as a dog. So how does YOLO work? This is a convolution neural network, just like we've seen. We create an S by S grid. There's several standard sizes for this. Usually, it's not too big. It's in the teens. Typically, it basically resizes your image, or it puts a grid over it more so, and it runs the conv convolution neural network, and it gets a lot of these squares, these potential bounding boxes, they're called, with predictions. But most of them are not going to be good enough. We throw them away. We set a threshold, and only things above that fairly well-established threshold are we going to actually display. So you can tune how sensitive it is in that regard. Now this is a convolution neural network, so we need to see how this is working. The output layer to this is very interesting. So previous neural networks that I showed you were either classification or regression. This is both. Technically the paper calls it regression, so I, I suppose it's regression, but I consider this almost a hybrid of classification. Because here's what's happening. Essentially, a whole bunch of bounding boxes are coming back. What confused me when I first looked at YOLO was, you'll see here a whole bunch of squares come back. Here, not so many. Neural network output layers are fixed length. They don't change their length, unless they're a generative neural network, but we'll get more into that when we get into natural language processing. But these are not generative in that regard. They're just giving you one set of fixed output neurons, and the, the number of output neurons is fixed. It's a tensor. I was wondering at first, how is it giving me a variable list of it? Well, the answer is, and it's more evident in this figure from the paper. This is the overall grids. That's that S by S that you're presenting in. It returns something like this. It returns a ton of bounding boxes. The total number of bounding boxes returned is always fixed. So there is a fixed number of output neurons. It's just you throw away the weaker ones that it's not as confident in. And here you can see the darkness of the bounding box. Uh, so really, that's dark, that's dark, that's dark, and that's dark. So dog, bike, car. So that is... Those are the ones that are ultimately above the threshold and considered. So let's look at what that output layer actually looks like. Because the input layer on up, that's just a typical convolution neural network. It's got convolution layers, max pooling layers, and dense layers, just, just like any other that you have. What you have, though, for the output neurons is a bunch of bounding boxes coming back. And each bounding box, so these are the values that are in your output layer, and it's just these six things repeated over and over and over again. So you have an x-coordinate, a y-coordinate, that's the center of one of these bounding boxes. Well, they're not boxes, they're rectangles. And the width and the height, because these don't have to be the same. So they're rectangles that are drawn around various things. And then the labels. This is where you can get a bunch of these, because you might have many thousands of labels, and here you might have just a handful or a hundred. Each label represents something like person, dog, house. And this is essentially a one-hot sort of encoding for these labels. So what you get here is, for the labels, whichever one has the highest value, that is the label that it actually shows it was. So person would probably have the highest, the highest value in that label. You could probably also look at the second highest and see if it maybe thought that it was uh, what the runner-up for that guy there was other than person. That label alone, though, is not the overall confidence that you're looking at. You're looking at this confidence, and this confidence is a number that specifies if it thinks that there truly is something there. So all of these other boxes that you had, you're not going to display those. You, you don't even count those. So that's how you essentially get this variable number of values coming back. You're always getting the same number of bounding rectangles back. You're just throwing away most of them. Now let's look at how many actual neurons that we we have. It's a 3D tensor that comes back. So it's not just a simple linear set of output neurons. You can think of it that way. It's really S by S. So however many, however big that grid was, say 10 by 10, it would be 100, times B. B is the number of potential bounding rectangles per grid cell. So how many of those you're going to have? This equation is basically straight from, from the paper. The 5 comes from 1, 2, 3, 4 for the x, y, height, width, and then the confidence. So that's 5. And then the number of labels that we have, so that one hot encoding, and C is the number of classes that we have. So you, you have to deal with that. It can only classify for actual known 
known classes. And that gives you all your bounding rectangles. You run that, and that's really all there is, is to this. Now, looking at what that convolution neural network actually looks like, this is your image coming in. 448 by 448 is the size that the paper was using. It was used as a scanning convolution layer, 7x7, seven seven, goes into another convolution layer, another convolution layer, also with max pooling layers, just exactly like we've seen before. There's nothing new about this. The only difference here is we have the 7x7x30 seven by seven by tensor that is being output from it. These are sample images from the paper. They even show an example of where it's misclassifying. Here it has problems with the person jumping from that car to that car. Hey, he's a plane. Nope, he's not. He's, he's acting a lot like an airplane, but he's not an airplane. They also talk about some of the limitations of this in the paper for YOLO. Like if there was a flock of birds up here, and they were fairly far off in the distance, it would not recognize them because it has trouble recognizing very small, highly dense groups of things. It was doing pretty well with the books that we saw earlier. Wouldn't do so well if they were much, much smaller. Now using this in Python, I give you some links here. This is to Darknet. Now I use this as well. This is the C version of it. I've compiled that and basically can, can run it from the command line. I've not used it in a C program yet, but many people have. It's certainly available for you. We're going to focus more on Darkflow. Darkflow is going to let you use this in Python. Now, we're not going to train a yellow network. You can. We're going to go ahead and install Darkflow. Now, you've got your choice. You can do this on Google Colab. That's what I'm going to demonstrate so that we can run it with a GPU. It'll be a little faster, mostly for recognizing individual images you're, you're fine without a GPU. If you want to actually record live video, then you're really going to want to have some sort of a GPU on your actual system. But but using individual images, you're fine with this. You're fine with a CPU. It'll take like five to 10 seconds for a single image. We're going to run Darkflow YOLO from Google Colab. I'm going to take you through the instructions real quick. It's not hard. We're going to need some files. So we're going to need the weights because we're not going to train a YOLO. We're going to use the original weights that the author of the paper got for us. This is kind of leading up to transfer learning, which we're going to learn about later, where we can make weights that were actually generated by people who have very high-end training environments with many, many GPUs and spent potentially many, many weeks training them. So we'll be able to benefit from those weights and load them in. This is starting to get there. We're going to do this both in this module and the next module. We're going to benefit from already trained neural networks. And we're not sending them off to the cloud. We've literally got these weights in our computer and, and can look at them if we so desire. So you're going to need three files to run this, and you'll need to put them in your Google Drive. You're going to need weights, yellow.weights, we're going to need the configuration file, and we're going to need the labels file. Now, I have some scripts that you can run here that do this really quite easily for you. So the first thing we're going to need to do is clone the Darkflow in GitHub. So let's do that. So we're resetting all runtimes. So I've run this before because I tested it and it's it still has to reclone it. Google deletes everything that you put on here except for what you put in Google Drive. So always remember that. So we've got we've made a clone of it. Now we're going to do a special pip install. And this will install Darkflow into Python. Now I'm in Google Colab. I've got to do this every time that I restart my environment. And notice I'm giving it a directory. That's that same Darkflow directory that we just checked out. So that's handy. So I run that and we're now doing a pip install of Darkflow and now we have Darkflow installed. Now, if you're doing this on your local computer, you'll need to basically do these exact same steps, but you need some prerequisites to be able to run Darkflow. You need Cython and OpenCV. So make sure you install those and read up on how to do those. Definitely the easier approach for this is to use Google Colab. Here I'm going to mount my drive. This is how I actually make my G drive available in here. And I'm running that, has to do some security. I have to pick who I want to be. Now I am blocking this all for security reasons. And then you copy and paste this, this little token that it gives me, come back to Google Cola, put it into here, and now I can unblock. Now these commands, these are Unix commands. This saves you the trouble of having to drag and drop all of those individual files. I'm gonna go ahead and run this. And all this is doing is creating a directory called projects in my Google Drive. Then inside of there, I have YOLO. So I typically create a projects directory in my Google Drive and all these different things that I need for co for Colab. I just put them in these various locations. So in YOLO, we have a bin and we have a configuration directory. Hopefully that all worked. That should have all worked. So that is good. 
all those files have now been downloaded. If you're gonna run this locally, here's a link with instructions from the author site on how to do this. Now we're going to run this part. First of all, pick which of these you, you want to have. So we have to change into the directory that we're actually running this from. So if you downloaded this onto your local drive, then you need whatever your path is. That's, that's where I tend to store things. But here I'm going to change my directory to my Google Drive to YOLO. And then the options, if you're running a GPU, then you want this part to be GPU one. Otherwise, you don't. So we're gonna run it with GPU. We're going to pull an image across the internet. We're gonna use cook.jpg, which is me cooking in the kitchen. You saw that earlier with my dog. And let's go ahead and run this. Now it's going to load the weights in from that pre-trained neural network. See, it's building it. There's all those convolution layers that we saw. And this is a decently complicated convolution neural network, but it's just one convolution neural network that learns to recognize all those different image types. That's what's really, really cool about this. We run in GPU mode and it finishes very, very quickly. Now the GPU that Google gives you is great and it saves us hours on this, but it's nothing compared to the next level up, which would be like a Titan V, which I haven't run it on that high high end of one. I could, I could do that with the enterprise equivalent on a V100 on Amazon, but that would do this even quicker. And that's what you need for real time, real time video, because you need to be able to do 30 or so of these a second if you truly want to be in the range of, of real time. Now let's run it and we'll see the results. Now, instead of getting that image with the bounding boxes and text all around it, now I get those output values that we talked about. So we see person, dog, cat, bottle, microwave, oven, sink, all those various things, the confidence, and then the coordinates and size so we see basically the top left and the bottom right. It's translating the uh, centers and the width and height into, into bounding coordinates. So this is great. You could do all kinds of things with this in your own programs to detect various things in, in images. Thank you for watching this video. In the next video, we're going to begin to look at GAN neural networks. This content changes often, so subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on this course and other topics in artificial intelligence.